Good morning, Mr. Hill. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. My name is Nadel Hill, representing Defendant Gonzalez. As you know, there are three defendants here this – three defendants here this morning, and we'll be splitting the time equally. I'll be arguing insufficiency of the evidence argument. The other two defendants will be arguing the inconsistent verdicts argument. So first, insufficient – I'm sorry. What did you say? The other two will be arguing what? The inconsistent verdicts argument from two different perspectives, and I'll be arguing the insufficiency of the evidence argument. So first, insufficiency of the evidence. The insufficiency of the evidence argument essentially boils down to whether being present with a lot of money in your pocket in a place unconnected to you is a sufficient basis to hold you liable. Well, there were drugs everywhere, practically, weren't there? There were – there was drugs hidden behind where Defendant Garcia was sitting, and there was a bucket in the corner. There were – which was not in plain view. The bucket had a top on the container. Yeah, but it was – inside the bucket were various kinds of drugs with different kinds of packaging, and there had been scurrying about in the apartment for about 20 seconds, I think it was, before the police entered. Doesn't that suggest that that was the most available hiding place under the circumstances for everybody to hide their stash? There were certainly people in this apartment for whom – one, the Defendant Davila said he lived there. There was another defendant who had the key to the front door. There were certainly people who had control of this apartment, but not these three defendants. Wasn't your client, though – was he sitting in the seat under which or behind which? No, that was Defendant Garcia was sitting on the seat in which behind Defendant Garcia there was heroin and cocaine. So your client just – all he had was a lot of money, $1,700. He had nothing more than money. I get the impression that what you're really asking us to do is to close our eyes and leave go of common sense. The whole scene is just replete with drugs and people with a lot of cash in their persons, and just pick it apart. I would argue, Your Honor, that it is respectfully – it wasn't as though there's drugs everywhere. You had drugs under – Well, who walks around today with $1,000 on their person? I mean – Defendant Gomez testified, and he said he had sold a car to the person across the hallway. He'd gone back that day – For cash. For cash. He also said he does work – he did work for other people that day and other days, and then he keeps money in his pocket. Not everybody uses the banking system. We had – the money was not unexplained with regard to Defendant Gomez. And how many people could be seated on the furniture in this apartment? I don't know that that was said. There were two couches. Yeah, and there were about how many guys were in there? There were eight people in the apartment and two couches, correct. And a television on? A television was on when they were there. When the police walked in, the television was on. They're sitting watching television. Mr. Hill, I take it that what we are required to do here is to look quite specifically at what linked your client to this situation, correct? Correct, Your Honor. And as I understand it, unlike in – with respect to some of the others, your client had a total of $2,804 on his person. Correct. Your client testified. He was the only one to testify, correct? Correct. Your client was not the target in any way, correct? Correct. Your client explained the circumstances in which he had come to be there, correct? Correct. So that it may be that your client may be in a somewhat different set of circumstances than, for example, somebody who's fined with a key in his pocket which opens one of the lockers in the door. Correct. Am I correct that your client had also not been observed coming to and from this apartment in the past? That is correct, Your Honor. There was no connection between my client – What was the length of time of the undercover, you know, the buys and the so on for how many weeks or months? This went on for approximately two weeks. My client was never seen. I would also add that if you look at footnote 7 on page 8 of the Commonwealth's brief, the Commonwealth says that there was a control buy that occurred just before the apartment was raided. However, if you look at pages 157 to 158, volume 1 of the trial transcript, Officer Goodrow was pushed on this point, and he conceded that the final control buy occurred within three or four hours of the apartment being raided. And your client would have no fear of being in an apartment with six or seven other guys who apparently are involved in drugs with $2,000 cash in his pocket? He wouldn't have any fear of losing that $2,000? When my client was there, there was no evidence that anything illegal was taking place. I would also point out that this – Well, that means that we stop – that we don't take count of the inference that when the police heard the scurrying around that that may well have been the hiding of drugs. When the police – the scurrying around – so one can speculate and say that they were trying to hide drugs, but you had eight people in this place. At any given time – Eight people in a place that can only seat maybe six. 
again, there are eight people watching television in this apartment. Where were they I mean, sitting? Well, you had two couches. We don't know what the size of the couches were, but there were two couches there. The point I'm trying to make here, respectfully, Your Honor, is that when were you the have- the couches facing the TV, the two that were there? I don't know that the testimony said that, uh, but that, that what the testimony was is that they were watching television when they walked in. But I think it's important to point out that one of the points the Commonwealth makes is that this was barricaded. It was not barricaded when these people went in. When, when the police came in, these defendants were not doing anything illegal. There was nothing in plain view. There was uh, nothing to indicate that anything illegal was going on. I mean, someone what, can. What, what about the chains uh, that were at the doors mm -hmm. uh, that apparently were taped to suggest they were used uh, as a barricade? At the time. I know they weren't in place, but they were hanging there in plain right. view. And I would suggest that a logic would suggest that if you have people in an apartment engaging in illegal activity, who have the means to keep the police out, they're going to do that. I mean, the, the officer Goodrow testified and said that if these chains had been connected, the police would not have been able to get in. Now, the fact that these chains were not connected itself suggests that while these three defendants were in that apartment, nothing illegal was happening. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Powers? Good morning, Your Honors. Dennis Powers representing Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, if this court uh, decides to adopt the rule of Mayberry in Massachusetts, it may have constitutional footings, and Mr. Fellows will speak to that. However, the court does not need to go that far in order to adopt the rule. Um, it, but maybe in Mayberry and Harris, um, that was assuming there were inconsistent mm -hmm. verdicts in those cases. That those cases assume inconsistent verdicts. <coughs> Well, Judge Friendly found that they were inconsistent. Okay, how do, how do we know in this case the verdicts were inconsistent? I mean, because the defendants were convicted, they were, um, the, Mr. Gonzalez was charged with trafficking in cocaine and possession of heroin with intent to distribute it. And all the drugs and all the money that's relevant to both of those charges are in the bucket that was in the living room. And whether the theory of the prosecution is constructive possession or joint venture, the evidence is the same. Thus but the both theoretically, one could f uh, w the fact finder could find that the weight of the heroin wasn't what w within 28 and 100 grams. Theoretically, I mean, you're assuming your whole both your arguments um, go assume that they're inconsistent verdicts, and it isn't necessarily so. Well, in my brief, I respectfully suggest that if the court adopts Mayberry in Massachusetts that the appropriate way for that to be handled is to require the trial judge, if he's going to render an apparent, a facially inconsistent verdict, to make findings of fact on the record to justify the verdicts. All the cases which have adopted Mayberry have said that if the judge does that and if he satisfactorily explains the facial inconsistency, the convictions would stand. The problem is here, we don't know what Judge Bellis's thought process was because he retired to deliberate for a fairly lengthy period of time, and he came out on the bench and he announced his verdict as to all seven Mr. defendants. Mr. Powers, assuming that we were to agree with you, assuming that we were, would it make sense to send this back to the judge and ask him whether, in fact, his, the verdicts were inconsistent? Well, I mean, Why I do we have to have a new trial? As I say in uh, my brief, um, at pages 17 to 21, on the facts of Mr. Gonzalez's case, personally, I don't believe so. However, if uh, the court- Personally, you don't believe what? That there, that I think the, that there is no uh, facts, there were no differentiating facts between one charge or the other put in evidence well, by- Well, let's assume that you accept Mr. Uh, Justice Botsford's uh, <coughs> uh, uh, hypothesis that the judge could have found uh, that there was insufficient heroin. Then under my analysis, as adapted in my brief, the court should remand to Judge Vellis and instruct him to make findings of fact as to, to explain his inconsistent, apparent, apparently inconsistent verdicts, and the court may or may not choose to uh, offer directions as to what he should do if he can't, uh, what would happen if he can't do that satisfactorily. If, if we find uh, ultimately that they're inconsistent, they're, it's the remedy is a new trial, right? It's not, it's not double jeopardy to try him again on the, whichever one he was convicted of, possession, possession of heroin, of I intent. think it was. I don't think that it would be double jeopardy on that count, just as any other case where you reversed the verdict. But I think in this yeah. case, there won't be any new facts come out at the trial. So I'm not sure 
that ordering a new trial in this particular case of Mr. Gonzalez would make sense. I mean, we well, we if the evidence is sufficient, we find the evidence is sufficient on both theories to, um, you know, justify uh, the charges, and uh, he's and we say, but the verdicts were inconsistent. Wouldn't we retry him on the? the one on which he was found guilty? I think that would depend on whether Judge Vellis could articulate a reason for the, inconsist the facial inconsistency in his verdicts. And if he couldn't, then what? If he couldn't, I think on the facts of this case that the conviction should be set aside. Why? 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 When there's sufficient evidence. Bec well, I take it you would say because well, I would the, say there the isn't underneath, the, underneath the trafficking acquittal, is a finding that there wasn't constructive possession. That's what you would say if he couldn't explain it, that there was a finding of no exactly. constructive possession or no joint venture, and that would also, w there'd be a sort of collateral estoppel issue, maybe. That would be my position. I mean, there, there were no differentiated. I mean, drugs and money are fungible commodities. Uh, they were all in the same <coughs> bucket in the center of the room, or off in the corner, wherever they were. Uh, there was nothing, there was no testimony put in by the Commonwealth by which <coughs> that finder could attribute the money to one drug or the M other. Mr. Powers, forgive me. Um, assuming that the trial judge had uh, followed uh, the, the, uh, the suggestion that was adopted in, in Maybury, in other words, had given an explanation, correct? Yes. And let's assume uh, that the trial judge had decided to acquit on one indictment and to um, convict on the second, okay? And let's assume that we decided that the judge should not have acquitted on the first, okay? What does that do with the conviction? I think that's the import of Justice Graney's question. In other words, if there was sufficient evidence, right? to convict on which, which indictment for trafficking? Heroin. No. For trafficking. For trafficking. No, no, the other and, one. And we concluded that the judge was incorrect to have acquitted. Nevertheless, the judge has acquitted. That doesn't mean that we have to acquit on the other one for which there is sufficient evidence, correct? Well, the judge has already, as fact finder, has already found that on the one there's insufficient evidence, uh, uh, insufficient proof beyond a reasonable doubt because he entered a verdict. That's what guilty. you are assuming. Well, that's what he found. But he might have found. But he not might have found evidence to, b to find beyond a reasonable doubt to be convinced um, to that degree of the quantity of the drug. Well, then they wouldn't be inconsistent, though. Right. I think that they might not be inconsistent. Right. That's uh, what I'm saying. They might not be inconsistent. I mean, all of this is speculation unless we know what the judge did. It, uh, as you, I mean, I don't have to recite to you what the difference is between why we let juries do this, but we don't let judges do this because we sometimes be think that juries can split the baby. <coughs> and that's our system. We don't have judges splitting the baby. I think it would be extraordinary for this court to allow any of these defendants to be retried on a uh, indictment for which the finder of fact found them uh, not guilty. Okay. I mean, the judge has made a finding of I, fact. I, I'm simply, I'm trying not to jump five steps ahead. Isn't the only appropriate remedy here to send it back and to have the trial judge make the appropriate findings? Well, that's my submission, yes. Uh, and, unless, as I also submit, that the facts are so clear that the, the court believes that no possible explanation could be offered to justify the I'm, ju I'm just looking at your, oh, uh, okay. Uh, in my reply brief, Your Honor, I spell out the okay. procedure I would follow and I suggest a decision from the New York Supreme Court, which is a trial court, but where the sitting justice did exactly the, the approach that I'm recommending today. Right. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Mr. Fellows, good morning. May it please the court, my name is Michael Fellows. I represent Jonathan Maldonado. Um, before I get into the, what I see as a constitutional issue here, I'd like to um, address briefly the sufficiency of the evidence with Maldonado. I think it's very important to point out that, um, as with uh, Mr. Gomez, <coughs> the only thing that he has found in, uh, on him is cash. There's no evidence that he was ever seen by any police officer prior to Well, it wasn't just entry. cash. It was $1,700 in cash. I understand that, Your Honor. And there are people who carry around large um, amounts of cash. And one of the cases I cite in my brief, I, I don't Happy recall it right Powell. now. Um, 
there's a defendant who found running away with a beeper. Now, beepers are associated with drug use, and the court said that that wasn't sufficient. Oh, there's a difference between a beeper that everybody, <coughs> just virtually everyone has today, or many, many people, and $1,700 in jail. <coughs> there again, there's no evidence to show that he's ever been in this apartment before, that he's been in this apartment for anything more than a few minutes. The barriers are down, suggesting that there are visitors who are not part of this operation yeah, but, there. But there, there's, doesn't the evidence suggest that there's nothing that goes on in that apartment except for drug activity, drug sales? There's, is there there's spark? Sparsely yeah. furnished. There's well, that's, those are mostly conclusory statements made by the police. The evidence actually shows there's a table and a kitchen table, and chairs in the kitchen. There are two couches and perhaps a chair, and a television in the living room. There's a bed and a dresser in one of the bedrooms. There's no evidence at all about what's in the other bedroom. This, you know, what, is this sparsely furnished? I think that's an equivocal uh, statement. The police certainly conclusively say that over and over again. It's sparsely furnished, but. I'm not sure the evidence actually shows that. You have eight guys sitting around watching TV. The fact they is- They couldn't have been sitting because there isn't enough room <coughs> unless they're sitting on the floor for eight people to be sitting in the apartment. Two couches and maybe a chair, and they're, we assume they're decent sized guys. Well, re respectfully, Your Honor, we have no idea how big these couches are. There was no evidence about that at all. And, I, you know, and, and that may just, again, show that these guys were just coming in for a few minutes. I mean, they, they, they knew each other, some of them apparently. So. And whether they know of a drug operation going on or not, the evidence has to tie them to the drug operation to either be joint ventures willing to aid and help and to know that they're, at least to know that these drugs are here. The drugs are in the corner in a bucket. The police say they don't see it until they go and find it. And the scurrying around, if they're stashing drugs, some of them didn't do it very well because a couple of them were found with drugs on them. That's right. There wasn't so, enough time. So, uh, well, I, I think that that means that those drugs were already in the bucket and were already behind the couch. And, when they came and the in. lid, as I recall, the lid wasn't firmly on the bucket. Is that right? Well, that's what the police testified to. Um, I'd also like to address the, the, the argument or the statement that's been made that, that it could be that Judge View has found that the quantity of drugs wasn't sufficient. If that were the case, however, then the quantity of drugs would be insufficient for all eight all defendants. Eight. And all eight. Yes, yeah. Your Honor. And since five of them mm. found that there was sufficient quantity of drugs, that argument can't, can't stand. Um, in my view, Article 12 of uh, the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, the, the statement that no one can be deprived of their liberty without uh, a jury of their peers or the law of the land prevents this kind of arbitrary um, ruling by a trial court in that your if he's, he, he may not compromise. In your experience, are these types of verdicts and jury wave trials, um, they occur sometimes, frequently, often? My experience, Your Honor, is pretty limited. Oh, okay. um, but uh, this is the first time that I've, I've seen something like this. And clearly, if it was that common, it probably would have come up before this court. Well, prior. I've seen it many exactly times. why they waived a jury trial. They were expecting yeah. to get more favorable treatment from the judge than they would have gotten from the jury. And now that they got half a loaf, um, they're, they're trying to rub the judge's face in it. Well, that assumes, Your Honor, that they got half a loaf. I mean, there are lots of compromises that juries make. One of those compromises often is that a jury doesn't find sufficient evidence, but they, they essentially follow what I think Justice Cowan's feeling was, come on, you're in this room with $1,700, give me a break, you were doing something. But is it enough really to send you away for 10 years Why for trafficking? Why should we have two separate standards of justice? If we recognize that, a ju that this kind of result could happen in a jury trial, why couldn't a judge be expected to mirror what uh, a, a jury of someone's peers would also have reached. Well, Your Honor, I think Article 12 expressly grants juries the power to do that by saying that e either, except by a, a, a jury of your peers or the law of the land, juries have the power, and this court has said not the right, to make those kind of compromises, to nullify cases. Judges expressly are not, and I think Mayberry lays out the reasons for that. The jury is but a but bulwark not, against Mayberry arbitrary- Mayberry is not constitutionally based. No, Mayberry is not. And that's a federal case. But uh, my argument is that the Article 12 is more restrictive because the language is more specific. And there's just no, no reason in <coughs> history or law. I mean, what Article 12 says is that it has to be by the law of the land, the rules and procedures that we generally understand to govern. Mr. Fellows, may I ask you this? Was there a motion to sever? I don't recall. I don't believe so. I could certainly find out and uh, inform the court in a letter. Thank you. Me, uh, sorry, Justice. Would you just I'm sorry, but wouldn't you say whether it's Article 12 or not? I mean, I take it your argument is that as a 
Well, would it be that as a prudential rule of the of this court, sort of setting policy that one should that trial judges should not be able to do this kind of thing? Well, certainly, I, I agree. As a matter of policy, as well, uh, and Brandano, I think, states a lot of those arguments very well in Article Thirty, the separation of powers. This is a, this is essentially a, a nullification if there is sufficient evidence. I, I believe there is not. Um, so that uh, as a matter of policy, it should not be allowed. Do either. you waive the double jeopardy argument by making this argument? I'm not sure I understand the question. If you're saying that judges don't have the authority to, to, uh, to uh, uh, compromise the verdicts um, and the, the law of the land applies, why then uh, couldn't we send this back to a judge for trial on both indictments? Well, or all three indictments? The cases are split about that. In, in Kansas and in Maryland, both of those courts found that the judges could, did not have this authority and simply vacated the decisions, reversed them without returning them for a new trial. If it's a due process violation where the, the court has simply overstepped its authority and has entered a finding that doesn't comport with law, it would seem unjust to the defendant to send him back for the same trial. Um, and even Mayberry, the courts were split. The Chief Justice there said, they shouldn't be able to retry them on any of these charges. But, but, but if, if the indictment that supports, or if the evidence that supports the conviction, if we, if we conclude that the evidence supports the conviction on the, her, on the, uh, the heroin charge, but not the cocaine charge, what? Well, let me start again. If we, if we conclude that the evidence supports a conviction on the, on the, on the, um, the heroin charge, uh, and that because of the theory of constructive possession, it should also support uh, a conviction on the uh, on the cocaine charge, the judge was then plainly wrong. He was doing, he, he did something he was not entitled to do. Are you asking me whether they can be recharged on the cocaine? No, retried on the cocaine. Are you waiving your, by making this argument, are you waiving the, the double jeopardy argument? On the heroin, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know that the case could be uh, prevented from going back on double jeopardy grounds. So I assume. Uh, that I am, if there is sufficient evidence. But I think <coughs> you're suggesting heroin or cocaine. I don't think the cocaine charge can be brought back. I mean, so the, there's been the, an acquittal. Yeah, there's been yeah. an acquittal. And whether that was erroneous or not, as a matter of law, I don't think there's any support and any authority to send that back for, for a retrial. Thank you, Thank Mr. Fellows. Ms. McMahon. May it please the court, Catherine McMahon, Assistant District Attorney for the Commonwealth. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the last attorney. In your experience, is this type of practice widespread, rare? Sometimes, Sometimes. it happens. Sometimes it happens. And I think that's one reason why some defendants um, ask to go jury waived. It I don't may think be, it's but common, but I think it sometimes can you, happens. Can you, can you elucidate a clear reason why the he may have arrived at these apparently inconsistent verdicts? I've tried and tried and tried to go through this. And um, these three defendants had a great deal of money, but they didn't have other things like keys or drugs or packaging with them. But the judge still convicted them of the heroin, but not the cocaine. Well, Gonzalez had a key, didn't he, to 5L? Yes, and um, Garcia had a key to this where apartment. Where he supposedly lived. And Maltaban had a key to the closet where um, paraphernalia and I think some more cocaine were found. The, the closet was outside of but the apartment. But Maltaban isn't before us. No, no, I, I'm. Yeah. But in any event, it's one drug operation, uh, so there was, you can't explain it in terms of no, separating there, there the two charges. No, because there was cocaine where there wasn't heroin, but there, but everywhere there was heroin, there was cocaine. So basically, your point is. Judges and juries should be treated the same. Treated in the terms same. Of, in terms of you can't look behind what they did. No. It, it, he, they were acquitted of the trafficking in cocaine. The Commonwealth's position is that for all eight defendants, not just the three here, the Commonwealth's proof was sufficient under Lattimore to prove them guilty of everything beyond a reasonable I doubt. Mean, really, really. The judge the disagreed. He acquitted these three of the trafficking in cocaine. Fine. But there was sufficient evidence that they possessed the heroin with the intent to distribute or that they were joint venturers in it. 
and that part should stand. I mean, when you look at the evidence, I mean, what you got here on sufficiency is a drug festival going on. There's, <laughs> there's drugs of um, different packaging amounts, um, crack, and I think powder cocaine. Ms. McMahon, it would be helpful to me if uh, one reason why one reason why defendants might want to go before a judge rather than a jury is because the judge will be able to pass out of eight people what the evidence is with respect to each. Right. So, for example, with respect to defendant Gomez, the, the evidence that you've just recited about the different packaging and the so on and so forth, what linked that to Gomez? They were, all eight of them were in the living room. That's correct. All the drugs, except for what was in the closet, was in the living room. The packaging material was in a, like a tile to the drop ceiling between the living room and the hall Could to Gomez the kitchen. Could Gomez have seen Gomez it? Gomez had $2,400 no, in I one pocket. No, I understand that. And $204 in another pocket. I understand that. He was in there in the sparsely furnished apartment that had <coughs> barricades, but they weren't <coughs> affixed at the time. They were scurrying just before the police went I, in. I understand. Let's, let's assume, just assume. Okay. Okay that you have an apartment that has a bed, a dresser, kitchen table, chairs, couch, two couches, a television set, and that, the, that some, certainly the person who, in whose name it is rented, who was there, I can't remember if he was or wasn't, and maybe some other people, were in fact engaged in dealing drugs. Let's assume that a defendant like Gomez happened to come along may have known that they were dealing drugs but wasn't himself a drug dealer, may not have known that they were dealing drugs, right? He's in the wrong time, wrong place at the wrong time. With $1,700 in his pocket. I mean, isn't well, I think Gomez be had um, $2,604, and I think it was in denominations that matched up with the different Things were packaged from ten dollars, I think, up to sixty-five. Sense, it added and up. And you're walking around with that amount of money. Why would you go in an apartment with so many people, where any one or all of them could take what is an awful lot of cash? But does it, does that equate to money plus presence equals uh, a conviction? It's, it's, it's can, money. Can, that's your position. Can I just money plus presence? The scurrying. The stuff being behind the no, couch. Assuming that, assuming that four or five people were actively engaged in drugs, right? And they hear bang, 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 Police. right? The, the Police somebody, were annou announced themselves. They announced, Police. An, they announced and themselves, And somebody's yeah. going to scurry. So let's assume that there's plenty of evidence that somebody in there was dealing with drugs. And can I just go back? Was there evidence that Gomez knew these people? In other words, didn't he go and see a friend? Well, his explanation no, 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 goes to, to weight. It doesn't go to sufficiency. No, but no, he understand. said he was there. So that he could, be, he could be going to see a friend, not assuming that his $2,400 will be taken off his person, correct? Correct, but that goes to weight, not sufficiency. The sufficiency is they're all there. There's packaging that happens to be out because I think Montalban dropped it. There's drugs that are out because Pimentel dropped drugs. The, um, there's also a key ring that I think Montalban, not one of these defendants, dropped. There's, it was actively going on at the time that the police hit the door. The scurrying, the lid isn't affixed to the bucket. It's on the bucket, but it's, it's not a, like snapped down. There's other things, a, a tin, like a, a mint tin and a film canister are behind a couch right before one of the other defendants is sitting. The denominations of the large quantities of money that the people have break down into being like $10 bills, $20 bills that go with the price of the drugs as they're packaged in the room. So it's not simply that it's the whole circumstance when the police come in with the scurrying where, where the drugs are, where the drugs and all the men are in the living room. Nobody's like running to the back door or anything. It, it's just... Oh, wait a second. How, how do you know no one's run to the back door? They're scurrying. Maybe somebody ran to the back door. They were all found in the living room when the police came into the room. Nobody was found leaving the living room. They were all Maybe found in the living room, according end? to the testimony. Was there a back door? Yeah, they were Maybe somebody left. There was a back door oh, with, with a back door right. team, right. which that's the right. police officers let the back door team in. Can you clear up a little discrepancy for me? You say in your brief that um, no drugs were found in apartment 5L, but Mon Maldonado's brief says that 6.0 Oh, 09 grams of co cocaine were found in that apartment. Do you know off the top of your head which is correct? I thought a scale 
Well, a and, scale for sure, but no. And money and um, paperwork in Gonzalez's name were found oh, in that know, apartment, those, those, but those no things drugs. for sure, but Maldonado seems to say, it, well, not seems to say, says 6.09 grams in a magnetic case were found in apartment 5L. I'll check. You want to check that? Yeah, that seemed to come out of nowhere. I'm, I was, I assumed that that meant that that canister was found behind the couch in 4L, but he says it's not the government's L. brief. So that, that could be of some significance because yeah, we clearly know that uh, one of these fellows, can't remember who, lived in, supposedly lived in 5L. Yeah, and if, if I miss it, I'm, I, I apologize, oh, okay. but no, I thought there were, there were That's no drugs found example. in that apartment. Uh, on another subject, could I just, as, as, as a um, part of our superintendent's power over the court, <coughs> if this practice, which, of which I'm aware as well, that the judges hear these cases jury waived and um, sometimes uh, render what might appear to be inconsistent verdicts, is there anything that we should do as a, um, by virtue of our superintendent's powers? If, if judges are not supposed to be as jurors, if they're not supposed to grant leniency during the hearing of the evidence, but only grant leniency at the time of sentencing, and here we're talking about mandatory minimum sentences, so that may be another reason why the judge did what he did. As the, a prosecutor, I don't endorse it, but if the court's gonna say that judges cannot split the baby, as one of your honors put it, then make the rule perspective only. It's not constitutionally based. Um, here, there was sufficient evidence of everything against everyone. The judge acquitted some of the defendants. They got a boon that they weren't entitled to on the evidence. Um, acquitted them on? On, what on, the, on the trafficking <coughs> and I mean, cocaine. Yeah, no, I just wondered if there were some other defendants who'd been acquitted that I And if the court looks at the sentencing that was given to the five defendants who were given everything, the way the judge structured it, um, the school zone violation ran concurrent with something, so he even shortened up that. It, it's, it's a legal sentence, but I think the way he packaged the sentencing for those who were convicted of all three charges demonstrates that he was trying to be as lenient as possible uh, with this evidence. The other way evidence. to look at this is exactly the opposite way, and that's to suggest that the judge was reacting as we have heard others say, gosh, they had all that money, but there was really nothing connecting to the, to the apartment, these three, so I'm, I find them guilty of something. They're clearly guilty of something, but the others clearly were, were directly linked to the, oper the drug operation there, so I'm going to uh, but if, proceed but, that way. But if, if, if the evidence was sufficient, legally sufficient, to convict them. Well, I'm saying maybe the, maybe it well, wasn't. It, well, if it, if so it wasn't, you don't have to get to the, if the evidence isn't sufficient legally, then you don't have to get to the question about can judges be like juries and render inconsistent verdicts. If, if the evidence isn't sufficient, and I'm saying it, it is sufficient, then, then you just answer the first question. Ms. McMahon, let me ask you this. Hypothetically, let's say uh, instead of Mr. Gomez having $2,600 on his person, he, he didn't have any money on his person. Same result? I think based on the circumstances here of how the police presence, came upon the scene, he the could- The scurrying. The scurrying, presence, where the drugs were, that everybody was in the room where the result? drugs were, I say the same result in this case. Not in every case, but in this case. The scurrying is very confusing to me because you've got eight people in there, and if we assume at least five of them directly linked to the apartment and the drugs that were there, you can assume that they might be scurrying around, but does that mean everybody was scurrying around and everybody that happened to be in the apartment watching television was somehow now implicated because of the scurrying? It's not just the scurrying. It's, it's all the- Scurrying plus having money in their pocket. That's it. And Pimentel had the drugs out because he dropped them. Yeah. Montalban had packaging materials in his hand because he dropped it. If they're all in the same room, and that's where they were all found, in the same room, something actively was going on at the time that the police officers hit the door. And it's not simply uh -uh. presence with like drugs in a closet or drugs in a bucket. If you look at all the circumstances together, something actively and illicitly was going on at the time that the police hit the door. And, and here, Every and and so, <coughs> well, perhaps what was going on, an equal conclusion, is that the three people were there to buy drugs. Nobody said that they were there simply to but, buy but that's drugs. A, isn't it an equally 
No, I... Plausible? It's perfectly plausible. It's not equally plausible. Sure it is. Why isn't it? They were there with money. They had no connection to the apartment. They were there with money. The other people had drugs. Well, one of these defendants at least testified, and he did not say he was there to buy drugs. No, he said he was there to watch television because he'd sold the car. I think it was one of these three. That's what I'm saying, one of these three, yes. It wasn't a Gomez? Gomez testified. Gomez, yes. And you're saying we shouldn't even pay attention to that testimony. Well, we not in terms of like the Lattimore standard. No. If, if All right. So then, so then, leave. Kind of difficult for him to get up and say I was there to buy drugs. Right. It's a well, there's no burden on the defendant anyway. No, there no, isn't. No, I understand. But let's assume that he was there to buy drugs. Well, it certainly wouldn't mean he was possessing with intent to distribute or it trafficking. You know, if he right. was there to buy drugs. And he didn't have any on him, so it wouldn't be possession either. And he had plenty of money with which to buy it. You're right. So unless the court has any further questions, I will check on the discrepancy about the apartment 5L and send a letter to the court if that's. Thank you, Ms. McMahon. Can I ask one question? I'm sorry. Is it your recommendation that, in fact, we should promulgate a rule here that judges who render verdicts like this should be making findings of fact and explaining the differences? It's, it's not my recommendation, but if the court is going to say that what happened here was incorrect and wants to make a rule, to make it prospective only because there's gotcha. nothing in Massachusetts law so far that says a judge is a fact finder, is it held to any different kind of a standard of assessing the evidence or rendering a verdict than a jury is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McMahon. <laughs>